Perfect. Well, thank you guys all for being here. Um, before we get started, I did want to do just a, a little exercise. And I wanted you to think about what is your most proudest moment as a coach and why. Um, so take a, a few seconds to think about that. And if you would uh, be willing to share. Okay. I'll share. Perfect. Um, I'm, I've probably had a lot of them, but this was the most recent. Um, I coached lacrosse this spring, and I had a little girl named Natalie who was new to my team, never played lacrosse before, and she was such a hard worker. I loved every bit of it. She was just like the perfect kid. You wanted to have a whole bunch of them on your team, and um, she was terrible. <laughs> she wasn't a good player at all. She just wasn't very – she didn't have a lot of athletic drive and motivation, but I just loved her attitude. So I told all the kids they would get equal playing time, and – one of the games, you know, it was 11 year old lacrosse, obviously not that super important, but there was a game towards the end of the season where she was in and it was her time to go in. And, um, and she said, coach, can you, can you put her in instead? And she pointed to the girl next to her and I said, why? And she said, because I just think she wants it more than I do. <laughs> and, and I said, Natalie, I said, come on, I want, you know, I want you to get in there and play. And she's like, coach, I really think our team needs her in there more than me. And I just like, <laughs> Cute because she was like just being so unselfish and she was like, and, you know, it didn't matter what the score was. She was just like, I think she wants it more. I think she wants to play. I think she'll play harder than me. I want her to go in instead of me. And every other kid I had was always like, put me in, put me in, put me in. So it was nice to have this little girl that obviously she liked to be in the games, but she was willing to sacrifice her playing time. I thought that was cute. Yeah, that's great. How selfless. Mm -hmm. Ruben, did you possibly have a story or? Yeah, uh, you know, um, I remember feeling really good about a, a letter a player wrote to me at the end of his uh, Stanford volleyball playing career um, and just uh, talked about uh, how he appreciated the experience and um, how he'd grown in the program. So I was pretty proud of that. Yeah, my, mine's very similar to that. I uh, was recently invited to a graduation for one of our players and um, I had been three or four years since I had coached him and hadn't had much contact with him. And, um, you know, getting that graduation uh, uh, invitation in the mail was just such a cool thing and uh, helped me to realize the impact I was making. So, um, but thank you for guy, uh, guys for sharing and, and just kind of hold on to that story in the back of your mind as we go through uh, this introduction today, because it will come back up in a little bit. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I definitely want you guys to all get credit for today's workshop. So uh, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. I'd like you to take out your phone um, and then text 650-63-2405. And in the body of the text, uh, you'll include all of the following. So the workshop number, which is going to be pound sign. And for this workshop, 00000. You'll, uh, please no spaces at the end. You'll type in your first name followed by your last name and then your email address. Uh, and what that will do is, again, it will give you credit. We'll be able to email you your certification uh, tomorrow. It will also get you uh, signed up for a couple of cool resources that we have, including our weekly email, our talking points. Um, and it's important to note that uh, we will not share that information with anybody. So, um, you know, please sign in. We, we encourage you to get credit. It also helps us track um, and see what kind of impact we're making. So just give me a quick thumbs up when you got that done. Okay, and I'm going to assume that that is done. Uh, and today uh, we are going to discuss uh, double goal coaching, uh, coaching for winning and life lessons. Um, my name is Eric. Uh, I am a hockey coach. I've also been an administrator as a youth hockey director uh, for uh, uh, several years, and I've coached for roughly 10. Uh, I'm really excited to bring this uh, workshop to you today um, because I'm incredibly passionate about coaching. Uh, they say that uh, sometimes a coach is going to be more impactful uh, than even a, a kid's teacher. Um, so I think that's just so incredibly important to keep in mind as we progress uh, through this workshop today. So let me tell you a little bit more about PCA and what we do. Uh, PCA is a nonprofit that was founded in 1998 at Stanford University. Um, it's based on 25 years of research and best practices. Just some quick numbers to run through here. On an annual basis, uh, we have trained over 80,000 coaches. We've reached over 3.3 uh, 3 million youth every season. Uh, we run about 2,500 workshops. 
And we've had over a million visits to our PCADevZone.org uh, on, a, on an annual basis, which is kind of like our M WebMD uh, for all your coaching inquiries or maybe challenges that come up for you. So what is positive coaching? Um, take a minute to think about uh, what, when you think about the phrase positive coaching, what kind of images or, or things that are conjured up in your mind? I picture a coach having fun and cheering the kids on, just being supportive and caring, um, enjoying himself or herself out there. That's what yeah. I I'm absolutely agree. It's fun for the coach. Um, it, you know, your players aren't going to feed off that. Yeah, if your coach isn't enjoying it and isn't enthusiastic, um, you're not going to get that same uh, level of emotional output from your players. So I, I completely concur. All right. I muted, I muted you, Ruben, if you wanted to answer. <laughs> Sorry, he had background noise. Oh, that's totally fine. He should be able to unmute if he wants to answer. But you can keep going here. That's totally fine. Um, well, the way PCA defines uh, that phrase of positive coaching is creating an atmosphere that supports best possible performance. Uh, the part I really want to key in on here is best possible performance. I oftentimes encounter coaches across the board that when you talk about the idea of positive coaching, it becomes this thought process of, you know, a trophy for every player or, um, you know, lack of competitive drive. Uh, that's not what PCA is about at all. We're an incredibly competitive organization. Um, you know, if, if you ask me to race you from this point to this point, you better, uh, you better bet I'm going to be huffing and puffing. Um, I want to win at just about everything I do. Uh, but the main thing that defines positive coaching is that we also coach towards a higher standard and coach for values. So the power of positive. We know through research um, that the power of positive is much more important than negativity. And one of our psychology professors from UNC, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, uh, has this quote. She says, there's a perception that the best way to get what you want out of employees or players is by negativity or threats. But negativity doesn't work well as positivity. Positive, positive emotions are especially contagious, and a leader's positive emotions are more contagious than anyone else's. Uh, I think this is incredibly important because as coaches, we've, you know, everybody's had those moments of negativity. And when you are negative, you kind of elicit that fight or flight response in that player. So you do get somewhat of a reaction. The important part to key in on is through research and best practices, over time, that negativity is not going to be very effective. And the most effective way for best possible performance is to go towards positivity. That leads us into this idea of, of this article from Sports Illustrated that came out in 2015. Um, and it says, study after study shows the benefits of a much more positive coach. Uh, the, the article was titled, the, days, the Last Days of an Abusive Coach. And really, those type of coaches uh, are becoming few and far between as we continue to change the culture uh, and give our coaches more, more resources to do so. Uh, now, here are just some of our uh, PCA coaches and national advisory board members. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you guys, what are some characteristics when looking at some of these coaches um, that define them? Or what are some things that kind of jump out to you about them? They're successful. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very successful. Um, they just, they have a good reputation. You know, they're known as, co as solid coaches. They, they know the sport well, they, they coach or played at a high level and they won a lot. Yeah. I, that's exactly where I was going to go with it. Um, that they have, you know, you look up here, Bruce Bochy, three world series titles, uh, Brad Stevens, multiple final uh, four appearances in uh, appearances in NCAA Steve Kerr, three, uh, you know, double, or NBA championships with the Golden State Warriors. These guys are winners, um, and they've understood that winning, um, you know, that positive coaching has helped them win. It's not just uh, one or the other. Uh, the combination of both has helped them succeed. So I think that's incredibly important to realize that success uh, helps and, and in positive coaching is what's developing our athletes. Let's take a minute to talk a little bit about negativity. Um, negativity takes away your mind from the moment. I kind of think about it like a horse and blinders, right? When I have a player that's incredibly focused and they're in that blue zone, uh, they're not thinking about any other thing other than their next play. Um, but as sports psychologist Charlie Mayer and Ken Revisa, 
uh, have stated, negativity distracts you from your task in the moment. Um, and if you want to get the best out of your players, you want them to be focused on that moment, uh, which is incredibly important for their overall success out there. Um, so again, it's like essentially taking off the horse blinders and there's all the stimuli and it's really hard for those players to focus when there's a negative environment. Mm -hmm. So based on that, right, do you agree that positivity works better and that negative negativity distracts? I would say, yep. Okay. Uh, and I absolutely agree as well. So if that's the case and positivity is a stronger, uh, you know, uh, catalyst, why is there so much negativity that's pervasive in youth sports? Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on coaches and parents to create little superhero kids that are, they think that the kids are going to gain confidence because they win more and they always want them on the winning team and they want to make sure that their kids better than everybody else. So they put a lot of pressure uh, and coaches, I mean, even in youth sports today, coaches get fired a lot faster when they're not winning. So there's pressure on them. It used to be, you know, you'd have the same little league coach would be in the league for, you know, 12 years. And I'm hearing of organizations where they're firing coaches because they're not winning in, you know, they're firing volunteer coaches if that's possible. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I completely agree. It's so crazy and outlandish. And yeah, the idea that it's all results driven and uh, you know, that's kind of taken over from the top down, right. From We see that professional athletes. Um, there's also another reason I think, is that we haven't done enough enough of a good job to give our coaches the resources to be able to combat that negativity. Um, oftentimes, they were taught, uh, you know, from from several old school coaches, and they bring those practices uh, to their coaching techniques, and they just haven't had the opportunity to learn uh, for some new techniques and have those tools in their tool belt that will help them make those adjustments. Um, which is what PCA's vision is all about. Uh, we use sports psychology research, the best practices of coaches to develop. Um, and it, again, you saw those professional coaches and athletes. They believe in this stuff. This isn't just something that, uh, you know, we want to make you feel good. We, we do want to get at the results based, but our way of doing it uh, interconnects the concept of being a double goal coach. So uh, we always say here at, at PCA, we want better athletes and better people. Um, and that's really our huge catchphrase. We're always trying to drive that home. Now, we talked about the idea of having a toolkit, right? It's sometimes I think words can just, you know, go one ear and out the other and you'll leave here and, and you'll be all psyched up, but you're not going to be able to implement those things. We are the uh, Positive Coaching Alliance. We are partnering with you. So we want to give you some tools based on our research guides uh, to help you implement these changes. So a few key support um, uh, materials for you. We have this excellent book. Uh, that you can refer to uh, on a constant basis, The Power of Double Goal Coaching. Uh, we also have that weekly uh, coaching email called Talking Points, which you're now signed up for by signing in. So thanks for that. Uh, and then, yeah, I did want to mention again the PCADevZone.org, which is a great resource. Uh, like I said, almost like a Wikipedia uh, for any sports challenges you may have or maybe this parent issue or you want to set up a leadership uh, course for your kids. It's just got a ton of great information. Um, and that will help you implement, uh, you know, our our vision and and your best coaching practices on the grassroots level. So, what does make a great youth sports experience for kids? If anybody would will, be willing to share, what do you think? Um, I have four kids, and if I had to summarize the best sports experiences that they've had, most of them were ones where they felt like a team. And they all worked together and they were just they were just friends. They enjoyed being together. Um, I think for girls, especially, that's a really that's a really big deal. My my daughter's a senior right now and she's thought this was going to be like the most perfect year ever. And the underclassmen are just not getting along with each other. And it's it's really causing a lot of stress. Yeah, that that interconnectedness between teammates and feeling that love. I I use that word all the time in my locker room. Um, but, yeah, that is so important. You realize it makes such a big deal especially when you have those times of uh, non-cohesiveness, it really highlights how smooth things were when everybody was interconnected. And, mm -hmm. and I agree that interconnectedness is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I think success, I think teams have to be successful to have a good experience. If you're, you know, the bad news bears that lost every game, I don't know that they'll look back and say that, Oh, that was a great season. But I think, so I think, I think definitely success is, is a part of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the point that we drive home here is that we do want coaches and teams to be successful. We do want coaches and teams to win. Um, and, but again, that, uh, you know, our underlying, uh, I guess, premise, so to speak, is that we're encouraging kids to have those life lessons while having those successes. Mm -hmm. So we found that a meaningful athlete experience hinges upon three main ideas. Uh, the first one being feeling connected to teammates and coach. The second one, believing that they can improve. And the third one, feeling proud about acting with integrity. Uh, so if, if these three things happen, uh, what, uh, what might you, know, you get with your players? I think they'll stick around. They'll come back next year. I don't know. Ruben, if you want to answer, chime in. I, don't, I didn't know if you could hear us or not. Or if you wanted to chime in. I feel like I'm monopolizing all the, all the questions. He's road tripping. I know. I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to answer. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're going to stick around. They're going to want to play the sport longer. Um, hopefully win more games. Get the parents off your back. <laughs> yeah, I, I always had a, a coach, one of my coaching mentors say that, you know, your, your judge of success is whether the kids want to come back next season. Mm -hmm. um, so I always thought that's meaningful. You're right. The kids are going to want to continue playing sports. Uh, they're going to enjoy being in that team setting. So I think that's incredibly important. And those three, uh, you know, interconnected points bring us, uh, you know, to the three main teaching um, points of PCA. So the things we're going to kind of cover today are one, we talked about that uh, kids feeling connected with each other. Well, we're going to talk about how you fill a player's emotional tank, what an emotional tank is, and, and how that gets the best out of your athletes. Um, when you talk about that constant ability to improve, we're going to talk about the elm tree of mastery and the idea of uh, results-driven versus process-driven orientation and how that matters for athletes and their development. And then we're going to discuss integrity, uh, honoring the game and, and how that gives kids a sense of purpose and makes them feel good about what they're doing. Uh, now I do want to play a, a video for you from Herm Edwards, who's a former NFL coach, now the uh, head coach at ASU, about understanding your legacy as a coach. And the last part of that video, uh, you heard Herm say something really important that kind of uh, always had clicked in my ear when I've heard it. And he says, when the book of your life is written, will it say that you made a difference? Uh, and that kind of ties in a little bit back to that first exercise I had us do about thinking of that moment that made you most proud, because I think those are all points where you can see that you made a clear difference, um, not just necessarily in terms of, of an athletic development, but as a youth uh, becoming a young adult, and you really got to be a piece of that kid's um, or child's you know, natural journey uh, in figuring that out, which I think, again, is so cool. So PCA's coaching model, uh, the double goal coach, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but there's two things that define a double goal coach. The first is going to be striving to win, and the second is going to be teaching life lessons. Uh, they're both incredibly important, but again, I think many coaches think that these things are two separate ideas. PCA's model brings those together and says that those two things are interconnected and the best practices to get the best performance. Um, there's going to be opportunities right? Where sometimes striving to win and teaching life lessons come in conflict with each other. Uh, could you think of any moments uh, or from your, from your past coaching uh, that, that, you know, those moments have come into conflict? Yeah, I was coaching high school basketball and the, my best point guard by far had the worst mouth. She just, her language was awful. And she, she that's how she came to me, but she'd be in a game and she'd be cursing out the ref and she'd be, you know, dropping the F-bomb to the players. And it was just, it was hard. It was hard. She just had a temper on her and uh, she would not watch her mouth. So there were a lot of games where I pretended I didn't hear it <laughs> because I wanted to keep her in because she was, I mean, she was just, her three point shots were amazing. And I just wanted to keep her in the game. And there were other games where I had to take her out because it was gym. Everybody could hear her. And I just looked like a fool if I sat there as a coach and let her just talk like that. So that was hard. I, I agree. I've had those opportunities before. I think it's a fine line, right? Between what is, you know, what is a little bit of frustration and what is over the top. Um, but the important thing to note is that in a, in a, you know, as a double goal coach, the double goal coach when faced with those uh, conflicts is always going to be choosing teaching life lessons over the idea to strive to win. 
Um, I always think about it like my players are always watching. I, I've had the opportunity where you're right, it is your most talented player. It's funny how that, that happens sometimes. Um, but it's like, okay, well, if I pull this player out for doing this, uh, you know, it, it, it takes away from our team. Um, but your other players are watching to see what standard you're going to set. Uh, and, and that's going to drive your team culture. And I've often found that if you do, uh, you know, abide by the, uh, the teaching life lessons goal and, and you really highlight that, your other players are galvanized because they know that standard and they continue to play through some of the things that happen. And it's, it's a great learning experience. So again, really quickly, before we get started here, we're going to talk about, again, filling the emotional tank is our first principle. Uh, we'll talk about the elm tree of mastery as our second principle. Uh, and then we'll finish up uh, with our honoring the game principle. All right. Nice. Did you have a clock there? That was exactly 20 minutes. That was impressive. Was it? Okay. Well, yeah. that's, that's good because I didn't, this time I did not time it out. So. Wow. Yeah, I, I have my stopwatch going and it was literally like 1956 when you finished. That was impressive. Let's see here. Now I just got to get out of this. Yeah. Okay. How'd you feel going through that? Um, a little bit nerve wracking, but it was, it was good. I mean, um, you know, after watching Amy uh, and seeing how she did it and um, seeing some variations on it was helpful. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, I think as I continue to get more and more comfortable with the material, I can um, one, make it sound more personable and, and, and come across better and two tailor it to mm -hmm. um, the audience that I'm speaking with. Yeah, absolutely. So was Amy's a um, coach workshop? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was unique because so it was at the Gold Crown, which is a gym. Oh. So one of the courts was blocked off for the for her present or for her workshop, uh, but the other courts they were playing basketball. So the whole time, whistles, you know, basketballs dropping, you know, oh, kids yeah. yelling, and so um, so it was uh, it was great to see that because she just adapted quickly, and yeah. um, you know, it was it was pretty cool to see that. Yeah, I did a workshop like that one time in one of those indoor bubbles, like those indoor turf bubbles, and it was so oh. loud, and there's practice going on. There are tryouts going on for baseball, and I had the parents in the corner of, like, behind a net, and all the parents. It was so noisy and so loud and so distracting that I ran out, and I asked the, the um, head of the, you know, bubble. I said, is there anywhere else I can go? And he said, well, there's a hallway down here, and I was like, I'll take it. So I, <laughs> I literally, like, stopped the workshop, drug about 20 parents into the hallway, and just shined the PowerPoint up against the wall. It was just, it was crazy. Sometimes like you don't think about logistics, but I thought they're not going to get anything out of this because they're in that. So I'm glad Amy was able to, able to adapt. What did you, um, I'm going to talk about yours in a second too, but what did you like most about what Amy did? What, was that your first workshop that you'd actually been to a live workshop? Yes, it was. Um, what else? I, I thought, you know, her body language, her positive body language, her active, you know, walking around again, because of the environment, it was really hard to get interaction. She mm -hmm. still did a really good job of it. Um, but it was kind of difficult to be able to do that in that setting. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I think it really keyed me in on making sure that you're getting the right information out, but mm -hmm. packaging it in a way that works for, you know, the location, the uh, parents, the, you know, coaches or that. I think that's what I saw the most is how quickly it was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. I need to change this or yeah. I need to alter this. And, um, and obviously she said she had been at, at, been at it for five years. So for her, it's probably almost second nature, like what stuff she can cut out, which I'm, I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh, if that happened to me 30 <laughs> minutes before I'm going on, I'm going to be like, oh, okay, what do I do here? And, <laughs> but yeah, she nailed it. So it was cool. The one thing to remember is that the coaches in the room don't know what you're going to do. So yeah. anything you do is better than what they think you would have done. So yeah, exactly. You can free <laughs> with it. They'll never know the difference. Exactly. They don't know your plan. I always keep that in mind. So, um, Ruben, are you there? I want to see if he wanted to give you some feedback. I do not know. Nope, I don't think he's there. Okay, I think he's there, but maybe he can't unmute or something. So, Eric, I, I was very impressed. I think you're so well prepared. Um, everything was very smooth. I think you're, you know, again, you just seem so professional and prepared, but you were also smiling, so you weren't being too serious. It's surprising how many times people you know, do demos or do their first workshop and they don't smile. And we're talking about being a positive coach and they're very serious. So I really, I appreciate about the, that about you. You have a definite likability. Um, I also really liked your choice of asking the coaches a question first before you even do the text to sign in. I think that's a great way to set the workshop off on the right foot is having them to think, what, what are you proud of as a coach? 
Uh, and there's a there's probably 20 different questions that trainers have asked at that moment when the workshop starts. And that's always a great one. What's your proudest moment of the co of um, proudest moment as a coach? You can also do the flip side and say, what moment are you not so proud of? Because we're going to get to that later on in the workshop too. Um, you know, what's what's a coach that impacted you? That's a great question. What's a moment that you just were really your team was in the zone and you were just having the most fun or think back to your childhood. You know, what's a moment you remember being so any of those questions that can get coaches thinking right off the bat, I think are fantastic. And I really like the way you went back to that later on when you were talking about Herm Edwards. I thought that was a great loop. Um, that was excellent. Um, you use we right away, which is great. Something a lot of new trainers don't do. We as the positive coaching alliance rather than saying they. I thought that was really great. Um, I liked your word choice. You said you made you, you made a lot of um, you, you used a lot of words I thought were great. And the addressing the topic of negativity, I think, is challenging because you will get coaches at your workshop that'll say, I disagree. I think negativity works better. And a lot of them will say, you know, I'm a I'm a travel ice hockey coach. I've been coaching for 30 years. These guys are tough, man. You can't be positive with them. You need to scream. You need to, you know, grind them into the ground. And you have to be prepared. And I like the way you said, you know, you said negativity, you know, it does work in the moment, but it's not going to be effective in the long run. And um, I thought that was a that was a very good answer. But be be ready to have coaches push back. And I think it's good. You know, you I always say there are certain sports that you would consider like the tough guy sports. And I definitely think ice hockey is one of them. So it's good to, to take coaches of some of these sports where they think, no, it's got to be tough love. This is how the sport is. And I had a wrestling coach argue with me at a workshop a year ago. And he said, you cannot use positivity with wrestlers. And I said, really? Give it a shot and see what happens. Call me back in two days. And he happened to be a friend of mine. And he called back and he goes, oh my gosh, this, that was awesome. Like these kids learn so much quicker. I'm so sorry. I was like, yes, you are. Yeah, I did ask, I did ask Amy one of the, cause I asked her some questions at the end. I said, yeah. fine. Cause I agree with hockey coaches. They typically are old dinosaurs and yeah. it's like rough, no, you know, so intense. And, um, and I asked her, do you find any group more difficult than the other? And she didn't, she didn't necessarily perceive there was a difficulty in like a group of sports. She mostly thought it was individuals within that, yeah. um, which I thought was interesting. And then I actually read this great article the other day about uh, um, a, a football coach from Austin and I'll uh, P P E A Y. They were O and 11, but great article. And he took over the program and all he did, like he basically de-emphasized X's and O's and all he did was talk about positivity. Um, that's all he really did. Wow. And, and he's turned them around because the kids are motivated. I think they've got like one of the better recruiting classes coming up because kids see that and they're like, I want to play for this guy. Yeah. Um, now, you know, who knows about the X's and O's part, but um, but yeah, I agree. The positive, it's hard to like get coaches to see that, that it still does work. It's yeah. not just. It's great. I, it's awesome. And that's, I mean, that's the power of it. I, I did a workshop last week, um, a leadership workshop for a soccer organization. And the one guy I asked him like, why are you here? Why did you come? And he said, and I'll tell you why he said, because two years ago when I heard about positive coaching Alliance, I thought it was a bunch of crap. And I thought, you know, there's no way these players are going to get better by being positive. And then he said, the coach that, you know, U15 soccer coach that everybody thought was a joke because he hugged his players. He high fived them. He would bring beach balls to practice. He would bring like donuts for them and he would play music. And everybody thought this guy was a total flake. After two years, his record was better than anyone else's. And he was playing really competitive teams. And he said, I realized like Joe was doing something right. And he wasn't the laughing stock of practice. He was actually having a blast with the kids and he got to know them. And and he said, that's why I'm here, because I'm here. I, I figured if it worked for him, it might work for me. So I think that's all. Awesome. Um, I also like the way you said, um, what did you say here? Oh, just, I, I, you know, I like the way you were talking about how the players are watching you. I think that's a really big point. A lot of coaches will be like, you know, they're not realizing that the power that they have, and you said it once, like coaches listen to coaches, I'm sorry, players listen to coaches sometimes more than teachers. Well, coaches actually have as much power as parents there's a lot of kids that listen to the coaches more than they do their parents too and when you said I have you have to remember that the players are watching you at all times and that again that can loop back later in the workshop when you get to narrated modeling um, as coaches even if we disagree with an official we have to model the behavior that we want our players to do so I thought that was great too um, some of the things I'd love to see you add into it is a personal story in the beginning of a workshop especially the, co the coaches in the room want to connect to you so they know you know a lot of information and they know you know a lot of stuff about PCA, but sometimes in the back of their heads, they're going, okay, well, why is this guy here? 
So just, I just encourage trainers to do a brief story about, you know, why PCA? Did you have a bad experience with a coach? Did you have a bad experience with yourself? Um, did you, you know, were you a coach that used to be one way and now you're a different way? Or maybe you're a coach that just had positive coaches your whole life. Just some kind of a story or a story, you know, about a player that you coached. Just something so that we can connect to you as a coach and a person and kind of get a little bit more of an idea of who you are rather than just like the guy leading the workshop that knows all the PCA stuff. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, yes, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So um, I would love, I'm excited for the next demo that you do because the next one is a principal. Okay. And the principal section, and I'm sure you saw Amy do this too, they're completely different. The intro I think of is the trailer sort of that's going to lead into the, the rest of the workshop. But the principles are where it starts off with the kind of the theory, the abstract behind the principal. Then it gives the coaches a scenario to think about, okay, how would you handle this before I tell you how PCA would handle it? And then it gets into the tools. So if you're talking about the theory and then you're talking about the principle itself and then you're talking about the tools the coaches can use, which one do you think is the most important? Probably the tools. The tools, right. So I'm encouraging you when you do the next principle, whether you can do anyone you want, emotional tank, Elm Tree of Mastery, you're honoring the game. I really encourage you to spend most of the time. And I get, again, I give, I say 20 minutes is a good gauge. Um, if anyone ever sat there with a stopwatch at my workshops, they would call me out because I don't do 20 minutes for everyone. But what I, what I, find a lot of newer trainers doing is spending so much time on the explanation and so much time on the theory and they do get the coaches in groups to talk about the scenario and then it's like two minutes blam 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 here are the tools and what we want coaches to do when when we do a workshop i'm sure you saw amy do this last night they fill out an evaluation at the end of the workshop and 90 percent of them when it says what is the best part of the workshop they say the tools the ideas the things i can bring back to my team so that's why we want you to spend more time actually, you know, challenging the coaches with these tools. How would you use it on your team? You know, act some out, do a role play, pretend you're talking, you know, have two people pair up and pretend you're giving feedback to a player on, you know, rewarding unsuccessful effort. What does that look like? Or how do you fill a kid's emotional tank when he's just blown the winning shot in the game? Um, these are the things that the coach that will stay with the coaches and it'll help them remember how to bring them to their practice. So I always just, and you, you know, you probably do that anyway. I just like to remind people that because we're not in the business of information giving. We're in, the, we're in the business of trying to change a culture. And the only way coaches will change is if they're inspired and they're motivated to change because they think, huh, that might work. Because I've got a, it's almost, I mean, I always think of it like if you were a salesman selling something, you would come up with a problem that the customer has. And then you would, you would attack that problem. Well, coaches have issues, they have problems. So we wanna attack that problem with a solution and here are a slew of tools we have to help you. And that's why in the course too, I had you like write out how you would use the tools because that's probably one of the most important parts of the workshop. Okay. All right, so yeah. let, me know. Um, let me know when you're ready. And again, the next, I usually have everybody do the introduction and then I wanna see you do one of the principles. If you wanna do it twice, you can. Um, you know, I give people an opportunity to practice three times. Some people take it up, take me up on three demos. Some people say, oh, I'm good with two. Let me just do the principle. And I, I don't have any worries that, you know, I feel confident that you could probably go out and do part of a workshop tomorrow. I'm, I mean, I think you did a great job, but I think for your own sake, sometimes it's nice to just practice it through, get the language down before you'd go out in front of live people. So if you want to do a practice session and then a final, you can, if you want to just go right to doing one of the principles last, that's fine too. So the, the, just to be clear, the principle is the final session. Yeah. Okay. The final session that I want you to do is show me how you would actually facilitate a principle. Okay. Uh, so if you pick, you know, um, filling the emotional tank, then I'd also kind of like to just see the transition from the intro into the emotional tank. Like how would you kind of shift gears into one of the principles? If you do Elm Tree of Mastery, that's kind of right in the middle. Um, if you do Honoring the Game, I'd like you to go all the way to the end and like finish out the workshop because the end of the workshop is just as important as the beginning. So you could go through like, these are the resources that we have that you're going to be getting and this is the culture piece. Um, so you can choose whichever one you want. As I said, if you want to do two more, that's fine. If you want to just do one more, that's up to you. Okay. And I don't, I don't give that offer to everybody, but I, I feel like you did a really nice job here. And I don't want to, th the most important thing for me is getting you out in front of live coaches. Practicing this way is only going to go so far. So if I feel confident that, you know, I think you've got it, but I think you just need one more time would be great. Okay. Perfect. Okay. When do you want to know by? Uh, you can let me know. Let me okay. know whenever you're ready. All right. Well, thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate your time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so thanks. It was nice to see you and um, take care. I'll well, send you, you a recording well. too Bye. so you can watch it back.